Well, hello everybody. Um, thank you so much to the organizers of this event for, for making it, it happen. I think it's really, it's really important. And, and Jim, I was listening to what you had to say and uh, I resonate with a great deal of what you're saying. Uh, first and foremost, the dead hand of scientific materialism. You very nicely pointed that up. Uh, that we have an orthodoxy, uh, a, a controlling hand at, at work in our society which believes that uh, everything can be reduced to a material substrate. And that if you can't weigh it and measure it and, and count it, it, it doesn't exist. And uh, this unfortunately is still in the, the forefront of, of science and certainly in the forefront of the academic establishment. But it's important to be clear that scientific materialism or the reference frame behind scientific materialism is not a fact. It is actually a belief system. It's the belief system that certain powerful scientists and their friends in large corporations and in government hold, but it is not a fact. Uh, and that fact, uh, that, um, that claim to factuality is increasingly being challenged and undermined by an awakening consciousness. And that's the second point of, uh, that, that I'd like to pick up from what you said, this issue of our state of consciousness, the human, the human state of, of, of consciousness, and the impossibility of moving to something new using the vehicle of the old state of consciousness. So with these preliminary rem remarks, I would like to look at the issue, the contentious issue of psychedelics and civilization, uh, and to place this in the context uh, of ancient history. You see, in our society today, the controlling powers, governments, large corporations, the religious hierarchy, um, condemn, quote unquote, drugs utterly. But we have to understand that those controlling powers that are condemning, quote unquote, drugs, are the very controlling powers that are ruining and destroying our world today. They are diabolical powers which seek to divorce the human being from his or herself. They have been responsible for so much misery, so much dreadfully bad management in the world today that I think we're reaching a point where we shouldn't listen to anything they say. And I see that to be very true in the case of young people with regard to the issue of psychedelics. Now let me be clear, I am not here to advocate drugs. It's not my business to tell you what to put into your body and what not to put into your body. But it's not the bloody government's business either. It's not their business to tell me, a sovereign adult, what I may or may not do with my own body and that intimate, precious part of myself called my consciousness. So long as I do no harm to others, uh, I believe that those decisions should be entirely mine and have nothing whatsoever to do to the state. And under the disguise of the so-called war on drugs, Governments and large corporations and to, to a large extent uh, science have taken away from us the most fundamental sovereignty, which is the right of adults to make sovereign decisions about their own consciousness while doing no harm to others. And you know what? Our society today does not represent the mainstream of human history. Our society today is an aberration. Our society is completely out of touch with history. And I just want to make a few points in relation to that. If we look at some of the great civilizations of antiquity, those civilizations whose monuments still stun and awe us today, for example, the ancient Egyptians, 
uh, we will find that the ancient Egyptians made regular, targeted, sacred use of visionary plants. And the achievements of ancient Egypt cannot be separated from their use of visionary plants. I have in front of me on my computer screen uh, an image of Nefertiti presenting an opium poppy to her husband Akhenaten. Can you imagine Michelle Obama presenting an opium poppy to President Obama? Uh, and in another uh, image from ancient Egypt, we see rays descending from the sun uh, into the forehead of an initiate. And those rays take the form of the datura flower, a powerful visionary plant. And you will find all over ancient Egyptian art the blue water lily. You will often see images of um, ancient Egyptian figures holding it up to their nose. You might imagine that they're simply appreciating the scent of the blue water lily. Uh, but this is not the case at all. The blue water lily was used as a visionary agent in ancient Egypt. And we can be quite sure of this because traces of a liquid extract from the blue water lily were discovered in alabaster jars stored in the tomb of Tutankhamun. And that liquid extract has only one function, which is its visionary function. Um, Interestingly enough, the ancient Egyptian tree of life, on which the god Thoth, the god of wisdom, writes the name of the initiate when he or she, through multiple lifetimes, has attained the life of millions of years. The ancient Egyptian tree of life has recently been identified by my friend, uh, the ethnopharmacologist Dennis McKenna, as Acacia nilotica. And the tree Acacia nilotica is rich in a powerful psychedelic called dimethyltryptamine, DMT, possibly the most powerful psychedelic known to man. It's intriguing that the ancient Egyptians honored a DMT-bearing tree as the tree of life. And let us remember uh, where we get the word chemistry from. Some might argue that extracting the DMT from the bark of Acacia nilotica was beyond the capacity, the chemical capacity of the ancient Egyptians, but I don't believe that was so. Our word chemistry actually comes from the name of ancient Egypt, which was Kemit. Uh, and from that Kemit, we get both chemistry and alchemy. So I think we can say with uh, some certainty that we do know uh, what the ancient Egyptians were smoking. Um, there's a fascinating relief on the tomb of Tutankhamun, on the second shrine of the tomb of Tutankhamun, which you can find in the Cairo Museum today. Uh, and it shows a, a row of individuals, uh, initiates, again, receiving uh, into the forehead, into the center of the forehead, traditionally the symbol of the, of the third eye, receiving rays of light from a star. Now, what's interesting about this is the comparison in ancient Egyptian iconography uh, with the pineal gland. And it has recently been, it's pretty much solid science now, pretty much confirmed that the pineal gland in mammals produces DMT. You see this highly illegal psychedelic, dimethyltryptamine. It is, in fact, a natural brain hormone. We all produce it in our own bodies. Everyone in this room is illegal right now. And we have to ask ourselves, why has the universe equipped us with a gland that produces the most powerful psychedelic known to man? If the ideology of the drug war is correct and all of these substances are completely negative, well, obviously, I don't believe the ideology of the drug war is correct. I believe that it's filled with lies and deceit, like so much else that comes from the controlling interests in our society. If we go back to South America, go to Lima in Peru,
uh, get in a car and drive 100 kilometers north towards the town of Supe. Uh, and you will come to uh, a, an area of gigantic pyramids that have only been uh, excavated in the last decade or so. Uh, these are the pyramids of Karal. You know, it used to be said that um, the oldest pyramids in the world were the ancient Egyptian pyramids, and none of the New World pyramids were of that antiquity. But we now know that the pyramids of Karal uh, were, in fact, created 5,000 years ago. They're as old or, or, or older than the orthodox date given for the ancient Egyptian pyramids. And Karal has been full of surprises. Our uh, materialist archaeologists um, like to believe that... Um, you can only create a, a, a large, successful uh, city-state uh, with some kind of drive to warfare. That the this is you know this is one of the problems with looking at the past. That I believe our academics make a, a serious mistake. They constantly look for our own reflection in the past rather than allowing the past to speak to us. And just because we are a warlike society does not mean that ancient civilizations were warlike. And it turns out that Caral in Peru uh, was never involved in any kinds of wars at all. It was a large, successful urban civilization completely without war, uh, with very positive and constructing trading networks all across Latin America. And you know what? Amongst the items they traded were hallucinogenic snuffs from the Amazon. They were highly in demand in Caral. So here, a very successful early civilization which developed great complexity without warfare or aggression, highly valued the substances that our society today demonizes and will put us in prison for using. You can go to Tiwanaku in Bolivia, in the, in the high Andes on the Altiplano, a very mysterious city with, with pyramids and, and, and huge structures. And there, there are two uh, figures, two monoliths, which are holding objects in front of their chests. Actually, those who believe in ancient aliens think that they're alien ray guns. But I'm sorry, that's not what they are. What they actually are, are snuff trays for the consumption of dimethyltryptamine snuffs from the Amazon. So again, we have an ancient civilization, a successful civilization that highly values the visionary substances that we in our society reject today. The same is true at Chavin de Huantar. Carry on up the coast of Peru, uh, drive inland across the Andes, uh, and you will come to a, an ancient place called Chavin. Uh, and underneath it, incredible constructions, deep underground galleries plunged in darkness, and we now know what they were used for. They were used, dedicated to visionary experiences, and those visionary experiences were uh, mediated by the San Pedro cactus, in which the active ingredient is mescaline. And you can see the iconography of Chavin again and again positively represents the San Pedro cactus. So how different from our civilization is this ancient civilization. In our civilization, you would be sent to prison for, for consuming mescaline, but in this ancient civilization, it was highly regarded and venerated. Uh, and you can see it all over the Americas. You can see iconography of peyote uh, in Monte Alban in, in Oaxaca. Again, the, the peyote cactus also contains mescaline as its active ingredient. All over the Maya area of Central America, there are, are stones cut in the shape of mushrooms and represented as deities. These are psilocybin mushrooms, visionary mushrooms, which are being honored in that civilization. If you go back before the Olmecs, there was an earlier people, uh, sorry, before the Maya, there was an earlier people called the Olmecs. And again, we find the same iconography with visionary fungi and plants being given an honored place and clearly central in the functioning of that society. There is even an argument, a very strong argument, that has been put forward by a number of radical scholars that the drink in the Vedas of ancient India, which is, uh, which is referred to as Soma, 
which allowed unification with the realm of the deities uh, was a psychedelic brew based on the Amanita muscaria mushroom. And uh, closer to home, go to Eleusis in ancient Greece. Eleusis now is just a ruin on the outside of Athens. But for 2,000 years, the temple and the telestrion at Eleusis were the center of everything that was most highly valued in Greek culture. And we have testimony from so many of the great names of the past who made the pilgrimage to Eleusis, who drank what is called the kaikion, uh, a, a, a brew that was offered to them as they went into the chamber of initiation, and whose lives were transformed as a result of it. Pindar, for example, says, happy is he who, having seen these rites, goes below the hollow earth, for he knows the end of life, and he knows its God-sent beginning. Plato was an initiate, Aristotle. Sophocles wrote, thrice happy are those mortals who, having seen these rites, depart this world, for them alone is granted to have a true life in the realm beyond. In other words, the initiates in the mysteries of Eleusis underwent an experience that banished their fear of death, that made them understand that this life is only part of something much grander, that the body may die, but that the soul continues. Cicero wrote, Athens has given nothing to the world more excellent or divine than the Eleusinian mysteries. Well, we now know why. The brew that they drank, the kaikion beverage, consisted of barley, and a non-poisonous form of ergot containing LSD-like visionary alkaloids. It wasn't, you know, just in the 60s that LSD had an impact. A substance very similar to LSD lay at the heart of the Eleusinian mysteries. So, you know, we shouldn't be surprised to find the use of psychedelics at the heart of so many ancient civilizations because it's obvious now that they've played a key role in human behavior. When I look at the, um, uh, the, the chart of the evolution of man, you know, from the last common ancestor with the chimpanzee about six million years ago through until us today, well, quite frankly, what I'm looking at is um, six million years of boredom because for most of that period, our ancestors were incredibly dull. They started making stone tools two and a half, three million years ago. But you know, the first stone tool tradition, the older one stone tool tradition, once it had been created, our ancestors stuck with it without any change for more than a million years tells us two things. They were passing down cultural traditions and they were completely incapable of innovation. They got stuck in that rut. And, and even when there was a change of tool type to the Acheulean tool tradition, the same thing happened. Once it was introduced, it got stuck. And they kept on repeating it endlessly, endlessly, endlessly down the ages without any change or innovation. And it's really not until long after our ancestors had become anatomically modern. People who look like us have been walking this planet for about 200,000 years. Maybe longer than 200,000 years, but the earliest anatomically modern human skeleton is about 200,000 years old. It's from Ethiopia. Every indication is that their brains were identical to ours, uh, their anatomy was identical to ours, and yet their behavior remained locked in that multi-million years of boredom until suddenly, and it's really after 100,000 years ago and most clearly 40,000 years ago or less, it's as though some kind of light is switched on in the human brain all over the world. Something extraordinary happens. Cultures that were not in contact with one another all start doing the, the same thing. And the thing they're doing is creating art 
creating incredible art. I don't know how many in this room have had the privilege of visiting the painted caves of, of France and Spain, and you have some in Italy as well. But really, it's, a, it's an incredible experience to go, to go into these caves and to see these amazing works of art that our ancestors were creating 30 or 40,000 years ago. Uh, as a matter of fact, one of the oldest pieces of art to come down to us from the Upper Paleolithic is from Italy. Uh, it's from Fumani Cave in Italy, and it's 35 thousand years old and it shows a creature which is part human and part animal in form. It has the body of a human being but the head and horns of some kind of bull or aurochs or, or, or bison. Uh, it's, a, it's a hybrid creature and you can find similar art in three dimensions from uh, Hollenstein Stadel Cave in Germany where you find the figure of a, a lion man with the body of a human being and the head of a lion carved in mammoth ivory. Now, we have to ask ourselves where this kind of imagery comes from. Let me be clear to you, the imagery is universal. The imagery of creatures that are part animal and part human in form. The, the technical term for those things is therianthropes. That's from the Greek therion, which means wild beast, and anthropos which means man. Suddenly our ancestors are creating images of hybrid creatures. Uh, you can see uh, an example in Chauvet Cave where a, a bison man straddles the figure of a female. And that female figure is actually without a head, but her right arm is transforming into the head of a lion. In South Africa you can see human beings depicted as transforming into antelopes or entities with the bodies of human beings and the, and the heads of antelopes. Where did the inspiration for this come from? Was it just, you know, some sort of act of fantastic imagination? Or is there an explanation for why this kind of imagery appears all over the world about 40,000 years ago? It's not only the, the, the therianthropes, the creatures that are part animal and part human in form, it's also certain patterns that appear in the cave art, grids, uh, rectangles, flows of dots running down the walls, zigzags, uh, nested curved lines. Again, the iconography is universal. We talk about transpersonal. This is a transpersonal iconography of the ancient world. It's found everywhere. You can absolutely predict, go to any site which has cave or rock art, and you're going to see essentially the same kind of imagery. What shed light on this? You know, we had a century of work on cave art which produced no results whatsoever. We only started to get results when a number of scholars, particularly Professor David Lewis Williams at the University of Witwatersrand in South Africa, began to look at experiments that were done with human volunteers and hallucinogens back in the 1950s and 1960s, before the war on drugs kicked in. And those volunteers were often asked to describe their experiences uh, and to paint or depict what they saw in the visionary state that those substances introduced. And astonishingly, what they painted and depicted was identical to the paintings on the ancient cave walls. And it becomes clear now why there is this universal factor in ancient cave art. Because our ancestors all around the world had discovered visionary plants and fungi, and they were depicting their visions. This art was an art of shamanism, and the essence of shamanism is the altered state of consciousness. Psychedelics are not the only way to induce a deeply altered state of consciousness, but they're one way, and they're a very efficient way and they are still used by many shamanistic cultures in the world today. Um, and as a matter of fact, this was, um, this was why my, my first experience with a psychedelic was totally accidental. It was in 1974. I was 24 years old, and it was at a festival in England. Uh, I had an incredible 12 hours, but the experience was so powerful that I actually resisted taking psychedelics again for many years. 
uh, even though I had, at that occasion, had a positive experience. It was the need to write a book about this defining moment in the human story where we became symbolic animals, where we started to create this visionary art. It was the need to understand that that led me back to psychedelics and took me down to the Amazon jungle uh, in the early 2000s for my first experiences with the sacred brew of the Amazon that is called ayahuasca, the vine of souls. And let me tell you that shamans throughout the Amazon who work with ayahuasca uh, very frequently paint their visions, just as the ancient cave artists did. And their paintings, the paintings of those ayahuasca shamans, uh, bear astonishing comparisons with paintings from the caves 30 and 40,000 years ago. When our ancestors started making this incredible visionary art, that wasn't the only thing that happened. Everything changed about humanity. Um, we suddenly seem to have developed spiritual ideas. There's no real evidence of, of um, burial of the dead before that. Suddenly we have burial of the dead, and not only burial of the dead, but burial with grave goods, with food and with water. When we bury our dead with food and water, that tells us that we feel some aspect of that individual goes on beyond death, some, some aspect survives. So there's the evidence of a dawn of, of spirituality. Uh, and, and hunting tactics, stone tools as well, took a quantum leap forward. The linguistic evidence suggests that this was the time when spoken languages first appeared. It is, in fact, the most significant change in the whole story of the evolution of human behavior. And it's difficult, for me at least, to resist the conclusion that the connection with psychedelics was not merely a correlation, it was causative. That the experiences our ancestors had, the, the mind storm that was introduced, shook them out of rigid, locked-in ways of behavior and opened them up to new possibilities and set us on the road to the modern world. So we should be careful that we love our technology, and it's a great thing, but we should be careful that we don't get locked into that framework, so locked into it that we can't see anything else. Uh, otherwise, God knows what will happen to us. The very least would be another six million years of boredom, uh, and, and quite possibly much worse than, than that. So I think if you actually take this perspective, look at the art from the Amazon, look at the art that shamans after entering altered states of consciousness are producing today uh, and look at ancient art, you will find all around the world these common themes emerging again and again, whether it's Theseus slaying the Minotaur. That is, uh, the Minotaur is a, a classic therianthrope, a, a, a creature of, of vision. Um, all of the ancient Egyptian gods, you know, whether it's the ibis-headed deity Thoth, whether it's the jackal-headed headed deity uh, Anubis, whether it's the great sphinx of Giza, all of the Egyptian gods are very anthropes, part animal, part human in form. And we know that that is the classic imagery of altered states of consciousness. And we know that the ancient Egyptians had the wherewithal to introduce, to induce altered states of consciousness with the visionary plants of which they were the masters. So this has been a continuous theme throughout the story of human civilization until the last 40 or 50 years. You know, set against the story of human civilization running for thousands of years, the last 40 or 50 years are like a little pimple on someone's forehead. We shouldn't set so much store by what we're told by our co corporate leaders and our politicians who claim to know better than we do what we need for ourselves. We should start thinking for ourselves. We should wake up, as Jim indeed rightly observed we are doing, because an awakening is occurring all over the world. So it's reasonable to wonder why actually is our society so rabid, so angry, so furious about consciousness altering drugs and plants. Well, but particularly where the psychedelics are concerned, which have a long history of, of positive sacred use, what actually are those in power really afraid of? You know, why is it that if you are found in possession of 
DMT, which anyway, as I've explained, is a natural brain hormone, uh, that you can have your door broken down by the police, they can enter your house without your permission, they can grab you from your living room, take you away and throw you in prison for years. Why is that okay? Why do we just accept that okay? Uh, why, don't we, why don't we actively resist that intrusion? on the sovereignty of adults. Because if we are not allowed to be sovereign over our own consciousness, forget about any other kind of freedom. No other kind of freedom matters if we don't deal with that one first. We have to be sovereign. And you know, it's not as if the controlling powers in our society are against altered states of consciousness as such. Because big pharmaceutical companies are licensed to make billions and billions of dollars every year from producing consciousness-altering drugs. Really horrible consciousness-altering drugs, you know, like Ritalin or Prozac or Siroxant, which do not enhance consciousness in, in any way. They actually just force us back into the box that our society wants us to be in. And, and, and what about alcohol, you know, uh, which is a very powerful drug, and by the way, an extremely dangerous drug. I mean, most of the, 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 the drug warriors will tell you that they're going to send you to prison for taking psychedelics because they want to help you, you know? Um, they're going to lock you up and ruin your life for your own good because psychedelics are, quote, unquote, dangerous. Well, I'm sorry, the plain fact is alcohol is much more dangerous. Alcohol is a very dangerous drug. It's responsible for countless tens of thousands of deaths every year. The road traffic accidents, the cirrhosis of the liver, the absolute ruin of, of families that, that, that comes with, with alcoholism, and yet alcohol is glorified and praised in our society and large corporations are allowed to uh, advertise it and, and, and promote it. I would suggest the Ritalin and the Seroxat, the antidepressants, and alcohol are all encouraged in our society because they don't conflict with the fundamental state of mind that our society values. Alcohol gives you a little holiday from that state. I mean, let's be honest. When we drink alcohol, it may taste nice. We may like one wine more than another, but we are not primarily drinking it for its taste. When we open that bottle of wine in the evening and pour out that cold glass, it's primarily the effect on our consciousness that we, that we like. We are taking a drug to alter our consciousness, but somehow that drug's okay in our society and psychedelics aren't. Actually, the human creature is capable of just way many, many, many different states of consciousness. But our society particularly values and glorifies one state of consciousness. And that's what I call the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. That is the state of consciousness that is particularly valued by materialist science. Our society hugely values that state of consciousness. Now, let me be clear. I have nothing against the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. I'm going to get on an airplane tonight and fly back to England. I would like my pilot to be in an alert, problem-solving state of consciousness all the way through the flight. But after that, I don't care what he does. His consciousness is only my business when he's flying me in an airplane. Psychedelics, I believe, are demonized in our society because they lead to questioning of the established control system of our society and the states of consciousness that serve it. And you can, yeah. Uh, have I done my half an hour? You want me to stop in the middle? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm nearly finished. I'm, I'm nearly finished, yeah. But I can tell. Yeah, uh, I've done my half an hour. I have, so, I'm sorry, I just go on endlessly. <laughs> Perhaps I'd better stop. No, it's fine. Well, I've been told to stop, so I, I stop. Pl what? Please finish. Would you like me to finish? Yeah. 
there's a history to this. The, uh, the church, when, when the Spanish conquerors went to, to Mexico, they, they proclaimed that peyote was evil and the, and the work of the devil. Um, they, they waged ideological warfare against the flesh of the gods, the, 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 the visionary mushrooms. The Gnostics, the Gnostic faction of Christianity, highly valued uh, visionary mushrooms, and they actually portrayed the tree of life in the garden of, sorry, the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden of Eden as a psychedelic mushroom. And they believed that it was essential for the progress of the soul for us to be able to choose between good and evil. And if we are to choose between good and evil, we must have knowledge of good and evil. So from the Gnostic point of view, the serpent was actually the good guy in the Garden of Eden. And what the serpent was giving Adam and Eve was gnosis, the revelation through the psychedelic mushroom. Um, absolutely, we cannot move to a new state of consciousness using the old state of consciousness. And that's why shamans uh, from the Amazon are increasingly visiting the West and conducting what I call a kind of reverse missionary activity. You know, we used to be Westerners who went to the South and acted as missionaries. Now shamans from, from indigenous cultures are coming North because we need the missionary work. Uh, and as a matter of fact, what shamans in the Amazon told me is that the sickness the profound sickness of the West is that we have severed our connection to spirit. And that cutting us off, cutting ourselves off from spirit is so powerful that maybe we need a powerful remedy. And this is why ayahuasca, the sacred brew of the Amazon, is finding its way into every major city and every culture in the world and is, believe me, changing people's consciousness. I am not claiming that all is rosy in the garden of ayahuasca. There are many problems, and we are going to have to learn to overcome those problems. But a single agency can bring about profound changes in consciousness, that years of reading and teaching and studying and knowing things intellectually would never bring about. I think it's time we entered into a renewal of our ancient relationship with the sacred and visionary plants. And I believe that they rightly used, responsibly used, with care, with love. Love being the fundamental issue, that they do have the capacity, one by one, one step at a time, to change, to bring about the consciousness change that this world so desperately needs. So I'll stop there.